all of our patients worldwide. Um, we are going to start with four scholarships. Um, there's an application, and I will reshare it to everybody via email who have joined us on this call. Also, we have started a resource list. Um, Dr. Hurley, Dr. Frazier, myself, and some others, and we will also email that to everybody on the call. Um, I want to go ahead and emphasize that the main purpose for this call is to talk about specific things around um, our children who are at home, how to talk to our children who are at home, um, even those that, that we have that uh, have disabilities or autism, some that can't speak and let us know how they feel. Um, and then also just about different coping mechanisms as we work through the immediate crisis and then um, probably a new way of life for all of us to come. So we're going to talk about these questions and then we fielded and put together all specific medical questions for some of our doctors that have specific training in these different areas, and we're going to get those answered for you guys as quickly as possible. I will say that one of the overarching questions that we've had, which I have already gotten answered for you all, is about mm. immunity um, and how to handle that with this particular virus. Dr. Holm Ulig sits on our uh, scientific advisory board. And he, um, not to my surprise, but he shared that there are um, many documented cases of immune deficiency, and that's a varying broad amount of um, different deficiencies from very mild to more severe and lymphocyte issues. So he specifically said that it is important for people within our community not to be afraid, we all know that, but to be very, uh, err on the side of caution due to those specific immunity issues. I've asked him if he would do a specific write-up for you all where we can um, share that information um, out in the community, and he said he'd be happy to do that. So while he's treating patients around the clock right now, um, he is working on that for us. He did also specify this was a day or so ago, but he knew of no patients, P10 patients worldwide, as of now, that has contracted the coronavirus. So that's certainly very, very encouraging. You know, it's possible that that might change. Um, but again, regarding immunity, it's important to err on the side of caution with that. And with that, I will um, introduce Dr. Tom Frazier. Um, many of you know Dr. Frazier as he has spoken at our um, our past okay. two scientific meetings that we have hosted. He is the past scientific director for Autism Speaks. I'll let you know a little bit about what he does now. He is um, extremely knowledgeable in the area of developmental disabilities and trying to help children. Um, uh, through that and through various issues. So with that, I'll introduce Tom, you go, and then we will um, uh, invite Dr. Hurley to speak. I would ask everybody to please mute while Dr. Frazier is talking. If you have a specific question, after he answers some of the questions that we've sent to him, um, you can send it in the chat function. Um, thank you, Dr. Frazier, for joining us. Well, thank you, it's my pleasure. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, yes. great. Well, thanks, Kristen, for letting me join this great, great group. I, uh, um, you know, I'm hoping that I can be helpful in some way. Um, although I have to say that as I thought about joining, I realized we're kind of just all in this new world together now. So we're just kind of all trying to figure out how to do our best. And um, uh, so as I, as I work through the questions, please keep in mind that I'm just giving you what I what I think at this moment in time, um, subject to change probably as we learn more or, or experience more of the situation. And, you know, I like to let people know ahead of time that a lot of these questions I'm going through myself too. So sometimes it's uh, do as I say, not as I do, because I make all of the 
different mistakes we make as parents uh, myself probably more than I way more than I should um, but I thought maybe I could just jump into some of the really great questions that people sent um, is that okay Kristen absolutely please okay. yeah so one uh, the one of the first questions we got was is anyone experiencing um, some difficulties with their child uh, being increasingly anxious and exhibiting signs of OCD. And in fact, I think we got two similar questions on this. Um, this person has a 13 year old who is suffering incredibly and it takes a whole a toll on the family. It's new to them and it's only getting worse. Um, so I can speak, speak from a little bit of experience in this situation. Um, Anxiety is to have anxiety increase in a time of uncertainty when everybody's feeling a little more anxious or to have anxiety appear in a child at a time when everybody's feeling a little more anxious is not unusual and obsessive or compulsive behavior is usually a sort of an outgrowth of, of a general raise in anxiety in some people and uh, a couple of just basic suggestions. I'm sure a lot of these people have already thought of but uh, I'll, I'll articulate them anyway. One is um, for kids that are anxious, one of the best things we can do is build in some structure into the day um, and to be very transparent about that structure, you know, what the day is going to look like, what if we have a schedule or if at least part of the day is scheduled, what that schedule might look like to try to develop as much consistency as possible. I will also say that exercise is oftentimes the uh, a very good uh, antidote to anxiety. It's hard to be anxious when you're exercising a lot. And so uh, aerobic exercise in particular, now you might not be able to get out to a park when COVID-19 is around, but um, you can still do what we've been doing, which is march around your house and in your yard or um, try to find a spot, even if it's inside, where you can um, get some exercise in and do different kinds of exercises, try to get your heart rate up. Um, if, if that's medically indicated for you and for your child. Um, I also use a lot more preparatory language to try to decrease anxiety. So this is what we're gonna experience. This is why things are happening the way that they are. If your child is like my son, a little bit um, more cognitively disabled, then um, don't use too much language, but just be really clear. You know, we're gonna do this, then we're gonna do that, then we're gonna do that. Um, and then a couple of really, really important things in dealing with anxiety is try to keep things as fun as you can. So one of the ways to sort of get rid of anxiety from a situation in general, or at least decrease it, is to make sure that as many people in that situation are not showing anxiety as possible. So if your child is anxious, but everybody else is having fun, enjoying themselves, doing different things, playing video games, or just playing games around the house, or just uh, enjoying each other in some way, socializing, or with my son, he can't really socialize, so we just engage him in sort of physical games or back and forth. I was playing catch with him yesterday in the living room. If you can do those kinds of things and you can put a smile on your face and really make it fun, anxiety levels do tend to go down a little bit. Now, the OCD part is a tricky part, and I can talk more about that later, but the last thing I'll say in this one is reinforce alternative behavior as much as possible. Reinforce alternative positive behavior as much as possible. So try to catch kids being good in any moment in time. Try to provide reinforcement, whether it's actual, you know, um, primary reinforcers like, um, you know, food or, or treats or something, or secondary reinforcers are oftentimes just as powerful. Praise, I'm proud of you, um, those kinds of things. Uh, I'll do a couple more and then maybe we can kick it over to Karen. So um, somebody asked, oh, go ahead. Kristen. Hello. Hi. Uh, uh, no, I just said, uh, go ahead. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, sorry. Has yeah. anyone else, uh, this is another question. Has anyone else um, who are part of the P10 trial seen this increase in anxiety and OCD? The answer to that is if you're part of the P10 trial, um, in the, the pediatric trial, we're not going to know that for a while. The data are still being collected and analyzed. So Can I, I, would just, I would just ask that you actually chart your experience. Um, try to keep track of it because that could be really useful to the investigators. 
if you notice that you came off of the off of the medicine or your child came off of the medicine and you saw a big change in behavior just try to chart out exactly when that happened and what you actually noticed so that we can give that to the investigators because we all want to find out if that trial was really helpful and that kind of information can be useful um, the, someone asked if the foundation offered uh, social interactions or online games or if there's uh, other things we can offer there. Uh, I'll let Kristen answer a lot of that, but I do want to mention that at Autism Speaks, they're building a website of different resources. And I think Kristen's going to put that in the resource list. But um, there are some suggestions about how to structure the day and keep things fun and interesting. Um, Another question was, how do we explain to our special needs child why we can't leave the house, go to school, go to grandma's house, go on vacation? So answering this question really depends on the cognitive level of the child. Um, for higher level kids, for kids with, who are more cognitively able or older, um, can describe to them how, um, how bugs or how germs or whatever word you want to use can make people sick. and and the more you go places, the more germs or bugs you can run into and um, that you need to stay home in order to be safe, but also that you need to stay home to make sure other people don't get sick as well. Um, try to there's give them also, a sense. There's also a couple books I wanted to say. There's a couple books that are online. If you Google that, you can read them right from online for kids. Mm -hmm. Sorry, yeah, excuse and, me. No, that's a great point. And Autism Speaks actually has some of those resources as well. There's a social story online. So yeah, there's lots of great stuff you can do. Um, for lower functioning kids, I haven't found great resources. I don't know, maybe you have, but um, my, my general suggestion here is um, they probably don't need a high level explanation as much as you think they do. And what they probably do need though is consistency and fun and activities and um, having a caregiver who's working with them on a regular basis to is helping them to feel more comfortable with the changes in their uh, schedule and their activity. Mm -hmm. And so I wouldn't worry as much about the explanation per se to them and more about getting them used to their new normal and reinforcing them for being patient, reinforcing them for being, um, uh, for not having a meltdown when things change or, you know, for just going with the flow. So, uh, mm -hmm. Okay. The last one. The, go ahead, Karen. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so uh, what I was going to um, add to that is on the parent side. You know, we're always used to having to be a good parent, even though we don't have it all together ourselves. But now this goes triple. You know, quadruple uh, under these times when you know the adults are also feeling a lot of stress. So, uh, you know, one of the big ones that everyone is struggling with is feeling a little helpless. There's only so much that we can do, and uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't seem to be quite enough to, to fully stop the spread, so that being with that helpless feeling is difficult. So, for example, the parent that has a, 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 a teenager with newly emerging OCD symptoms, you can feel a little out of control anyway, and then having this new situation uh, come up can make you feel a little more helpless. So I think we need to, you know, appreciate that, you know, this is a, this is an emotion that's difficult under the best of circumstances, but when we're feeling surrounded by threat and when we're, you know, reading about threat over and over, like, you know, on, online, that, um, that you know, uh, the adults can also have more uh, a sense of, of overload and then have the pressure of turning around and then trying to uh, be reassuring to children. I think it's also worth noting that as adults, we're all stepping into roles that aren't familiar to us. You know, pe parents who are at home with kids are being more of a teacher than they're used to, right? Or someone who's used to working full time and is suddenly not at that place where they have those social contacts, where they get to feel competent, you know, with the skills that they've developed over time. So everybody's kind of like a little bit on a wrong foot. So anything that you can do to help um, reduce your own anxiety, to 
uh, reduce stress through breathing, through um, accepting emotions, you know, things of that nature. And we can talk about them more. This is kind of like that, I'm sure you hear it over and over again, put your own mask on, your own air mask on before helping someone else. And again, this is a situation where everything that you do for your individual well-being helps raise the whole family quality of life. Yeah, that's a great that's, point. Man. Yeah. So, Tom, I think you had another question that you wanted to, to tackle. Yeah, actually, this one really gets to what you were saying, actually. Could you give us ways to cope if we're out of work or if we have to go to work? Exactly. And, mm -hmm. um, I think all the things that Karen, I won't, I won't um, reiterate uh, the things that Karen just said, which were excellent, but I'll add a few um, sort of specific ideas here. Um, for some people, when you're separated because one of your uh, your spouse or, or your significant other has to go to work, I would, for, number one, try to communicate at least a few times a day, even if it's through text, um, and try to communicate as supportively as possible. Um, give each other something to look forward to at the end of the day, too. So, mm -hmm. you know, when you're away and one of the one of the caregivers is taking on the primary responsibility for caring for a child, then um, it's really important that the other caregiver, even though they're working a hard day and they may even be in a situation where they feel exposed to the COVID-19 or illness, um, it's still important for that caregiver to realize that it can be tough to be home with a child, with, especially if they have a developmental disability or some kind of learning issue. And so try to give them something to look forward to at the end of the day, whether it's just a break or time to take a shower or a warm bath or to watch a show or some kind of simple pleasure for them and offer lots of verbal support for them. Um, I would also try to keep some kind of measure of normalcy around the house, meaning, you know, um, try to at least keep some kind of sense of time, like, okay, you know, this is getting better over time. Um, we may be able to return to a greater sense of normalcy in three or six maybe less, um, be really, really kind to each other. Um, you know, so if somebody says something and you have this sort of innate sense that you want to snap at them, um, because you feel like it was a little out of line, so check yourself, take, give yourself a few seconds to think about your reaction, and then um, you know, try to come back with a, a more empathic response, um, because realize that their response to you even though it triggered a negative reaction in you, it was probably just a, a function of their experience and the difficulties that they're having. Um, so that's, you know, um, mm -hmm. so that's something to just keep in your mind is that if, if, there's a, uh, if there's a negative thing going on that you want to try to hash that out as quickly as possible, don't let it linger because we're already in this anx anxious time. Um, mm -hmm. And I would also just add, try to set, you know, for those of you that are out of work or having trouble with what's next for you professionally, and that's causing some anxiety for you, um, you know, start trying to plan about what might your next opportunity look like. Um, set some medium term goals and strategize about opportunities. You know, I know in the US, and this is not true everywhere, but I've been reading that, you know, there when when we get through this critical period there are going to be places that are looking to hire and there's going to be a lot of people out of work so there's going to be a lot of applications and so you might want to start strategizing now about how to get an opportunity there and that could also help decrease your anxiety about the situation mm -hmm. um, and there's a couple of helpful um, resources that i gave to kristen i'll just mention one person asked about homeschooling with special needs one is one Website I like is homeschool.com, and um, there's also a few uh, companies that offer homeschooling services. I wouldn't necessarily recommend a company per se, but you can go to their websites and check them out. Um, one I found was Calvert. There's a few other ones. And there was a question about suicide, and yeah. suicide in, in this moment is really tough. I'll just, Karen, you can give your uh, take, but I'll just want to offer yeah. that we, we do have the autism response team for situations where it's a person with a developmental disability that 
has a concern about suicide and they can help you to identify local resources like county suicide resources. There's also the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. Mm -hmm. um, talk to those folks as well. Karen, what did you have about that? Uh, yeah, so I was also going to mention the, uh, the National Suicide Prevention Hotline and that's 1-800-273-8255. And I think it's really important to address this because, you know, I've certainly been noticing, I've been doing, um, you know, uh, virtual visits with patients uh, for the last week and I've definitely seen more people expressing distress and people, uh, patients who I'm, you know, very familiar with who are talking more about suicidal thoughts than usual. And that's very distressing when you're a family member to, um, to hear those things. If your family member, uh, has a mental health provider already, um, it's uh, very uh, appropriate uh, for you to call that person, uh, call the provider and let them know, let them know what's going on. Uh, your provider may well have some kind of arrangement to do a virtual visit, uh, especially if it's in an, um, uh, you know, an emergency and we consider suicidal thoughts an emergency. If someone is talking about a specific method uh, that's when you really need to pay uh, very close attention and take action. Um, if someone is talking about a lethal uh, means, uh, uh, especially if they talk about a gun, is to secure that weapon, uh, preferably where they don't know where it is. Um, and then this is going to be a really tough one. Normally the advice would be get your loved one to an emergency room for them to be professionally evaluated for their safety and whether they need to be in a psychiatric hospital. Depending on where you live, emergency rooms may be overwhelmed right now, right? So all, you know, all across the country, people are scrambling to provide services to all their patients in a time when, uh, you know, they're being overwhelmed by a particular kind of patient that is contagious right? And so this may be destabilizing. So some people are feeling like the emergency room is a dangerous place to go because there are going to be people who are contagious there. So these are tough, tough choices. So absolutely reach out. Do not feel like you're alone with that and, and garner every resource you can to help your loved one um, stay safe in a difficult time. Um, so uh, I, I wanted to say a little, we've, uh, we've talked quite a bit about the, um, the aspect of P10 syndrome that has to do with autism and that, that many of you have uh, 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 children with developmental disability or may have it yourself. Um, but there is another aspect of P10 and that is the cancer risk. And uh, so one of the things that we're seeing is that for people who have prophylactic procedures scheduled, um, risk-reducing procedures, or if you're on a, uh, a surveillance, uh, you know, if say you were due to have uh, a thyroid ultrasound um, and that got canceled on you, you know, that is a, a particular source of stress to people who have hereditary cancer risk. And there are no easy answers for this. When, you know, uh, in these situations of uncertainty, one of the phrases I like to use is that things are neither bigger nor smaller than they are. So you want to validate the real fears, right? You do want to be keeping up with your screenings. You do want to be taking the steps that you have been recommended to take, right? Um, your mind may be racing ahead to thinking, oh my God, I've got cancer already and I can feel it growing. That's making something even bigger than it is, right? But you also maybe feel feeling minimized right now. Well, you're, at least you're not sick right now. That kind of makes it too small. So you want to um, be able to give yourself and give the people around you that sense of hearing them for what it is. This is tough. Nobody wants to be in this situation. And we're going to help each other be with the reality of it and not stretch it or shrink it, um, which would make things even more difficult to cope with.
Um, Tom, did you see other questions that we can uh, look at, uh, especially because I know you're going to be leaving sooner? There was one question about a child with severe learning difficulties who's nonverbal and has autism. Mm -hmm. And he's working himself up due to the changes in routine. All right. Using his hands, rubbing his teeth, rubbing them on his teeth a lot. And it's very upsetting to the parents, understandably. Um, I, I'll, I'll, I actually have a lot of professional and personal experience in this area, so I can mm -hmm. give you what I've learned over time. Um, I, I already mentioned the sort of basic stuff about reducing anxiety in general, but it's with nonverbal individuals, it's really important to emphasize things like scheduling and first then and activity boards and using preparatory language. So I'll just reemphasize that part for the general anxiety piece. For the, for the um, you know, for the specifics about this behavior of rubbing, uh, their bruising their hand on their teeth a lot. Um, first of all, I would, I, again, I would emphasize try to try to get the anxiety level in general down as much as possible. So try to have as much fun as possible. Try to keep your mood and facial expressions as positive as possible. Provide lots of non-contingent praise and reinforcement. So catch them being good, tell them that you love them, that you're, you're proud of them, catch them doing good things that they should be doing. The other thing about this though, is this is obviously a behavior that's uh, it's being reinforced, most likely automatically reinforced, which means that the behavior itself has some self-soothing sort of um, process to it. That's my guess. You don't ever know until you see these things in person, but that's my guess. And so if it is more of a compulsive or automatically reinforced behavior, then the best strategy really is to redirect it silently and offer an alternative behavior that you can reinforce like hands in pockets, give five, rub, rub flat hands on your thighs, and really anything that isn't gonna hurt or bruise their hand as much. Maybe um, a stress ball? You Something can use that they stress balls. Yeah, you can use any, any we, used to, we would use uh, squish balls and stress balls. Um, Try to find a, a, an alternative behavior, though, that is, we use the term, incompatible with the behavior that they're currently using. So try to find something that actually would essentially not allow them to engage in that behavior while they're doing it. Um, and then reinforce as strongly as you can engaging in that behavior, but not the behavior that causes them to bruise their hands. Um, if it's to gain, sometimes, and this is very, sounds very unusual, but it's true. Sometimes it, this behavior can actually be reinforced by attention. And so it's important not to pay attention to the behavior, but to redirect it again silently without eye contact and to provide, you know, so when you're doing that, you're just doing that to stop that behavior. But when that's not happening, you have to provide lots of attention, lots of eye contact, lots of praise and reinforcement for other behaviors that are not happening. When that behavior is not happening, you want to praise those other behaviors. So um, if it's attention-based, that's more effective. It's, if it's compulsive, you really just have to reinforce some alternative behavior and try to redirect it as much as possible. The other question I got before I jump or before we can take questions or, or Karen, you can do another one is um, mm -hmm. uh, somebody asked about electronics. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's a good one. And uh, that's a very common question. Um, and uh, you know, the, <laughs> the only thing I would say there is, um, I would try to, I, I try to limit any activity, no matter how educational or non-educational it is, I would try to limit any activity to, to less than a few hours. And I'd preferably like to do it in short stints and actually reinforce shifting from that activity, something else that's socially appropriate. Um, so try to, if you, if, you know, I know this is hard, believe me, I'm a parent, I get it. It's hard. You, you got to try to limit that and say, okay, you can do this for 20 minutes or whatever is you think is an appropriate amount of time, but try not to let it be hours. And, and then say, okay, now we're going to go do this and we can do that for a while. And if the person really engages, if the child really engages in that, then you can reinforce them with another 10 minutes or 20 minutes of electronics. But our kids tend to be so focused on electronics sometimes that it's really important to try to limit it to short bursts if you possibly can and intersperse those bursts with, other more appropriate, maybe physical or social kinds of activities. 
Karen, did you want to add? Yeah, no, that that was uh, going to be my exact suggestion is is um, alternating. Um, you can have it on a schedule. You know, you, you talked earlier about, you know, outlining a schedule at the beginning of the day. You can just put screen time, right? And that, you know, they can choose what their screen time is, you know, like it might be, you know, screen time number one is, uh, you know, a game. Uh, then you're doing something else. Then when they have screen time number two, it could be a movie, right? You can watch Frozen for the, what, 48th time, um, <laughs> right? Or, um, uh, you know, so, um, I, and I think that one thing I wanted to um, point out, it, you know, two things. Number one, you know, a lot of the, you know, what we consider normal rules are kind of off right now. So, uh, you know, we're, uh, there's a little bit of a sense of, you know, uh, what's, we don't know what's appropriate right now. You know, how long is a good time to be, you know, using um, a, a screen-based device or not, right? So, um, you know, you can make some, uh, you know, you can, you know, set your own rules that way. You can also watch, you know, if the kids start seeming, uh, too spaced out, too irritable, you know, that might be a sign that they're overdoing it on the screen, right? Or, you know, too passive. Uh, so that, you know, build, uh, think, building it in ahead of time. The other thing I wanted to say is in terms of people being off of their routines, every routine was once new. So the fact that you're setting new, you know, you're, you're off of your usual routines, means that you have to create a new one, right? But we still want to get to them. So there's that little bit of transition period where you decide what the new routine is. Um, but you've been here before, maybe not so consciously and, not, and you know, without realizing it, but that you have already set routines. And so now, you know, the situation is calling for a different one than your usual. Are there other questions that for Karen or for for me or? Mm -hmm. I see I see the chat. I don't know, Kristen, if there's something in there I missed. You want me to address or Karen to address? Um, I see that oh, Becky wait, Palmer had Becky had mentioned having um, that their child enjoys homeschooling. Oh yeah. Um, <laughs> let me let you ask then, Becky. Go ahead. Go ahead and ask. It's a good question. So our daughter, um, we usually we go to a public school and we've had a difficult time with her social interaction in the past. And um, we noticed that she's actually thoroughly enjoying the homeschooling where she gets that one to one attention. So our concern is when we transition back to the classroom, what are some tips and tricks that we can do so that she knows that that is her normal. This is outside of her normal and not to expect this as a change that's going to stay permanent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's lots of things you can do, and Karen, Karen chime in too. Uh, there's a few things I'm just thinking of off the top of my head. Uh, one is as you get closer to the transition time. If, um, sorry, I'm getting a lot of background noise. He's a um, very important doctor. If you, if you, um, as you get closer to the to the transition time, I would do a couple of things at least. Um, one is start talking with their teachers about making the. You uh -oh. you muted. Yeah, oh, I know. Oh. Wrong person. Sorry about that. Oh, that's all right. So as you get closer to the transition, talk to the teacher about um, how to make it as easy, as smooth as possible. That could be anything from saving some reinforcements that are high reinforcers for, for your, your daughter um, and, um, you know, using them only at school to make school as reinforcing as possible. Um, it could be um, transitioning more slowly, so maybe giving her a break for a day and then going back or something. As long as that doesn't reinforce escape, that can work. Um, but making sure she's very aware of what the schedule is going to look like. Um, I'd also just talk to the teacher about what's worked at home and what she's enjoyed and how that's been enjoyable for her, because maybe there's things that the teacher can do to accommodate that in the classroom. Um, I would also be really careful as you get closer or as you make the transition, I'd be really careful to, and this sounds, this is going to sound a little weird, but um, I'd be very careful about anything that's super reinforcing at home. 
I'd be really careful about limiting that too much because you don't want home to be contrasted with school and seeming like such a fun place and school seeming like such a horrible place. Um, so you want to be careful and not make home too fun and exciting, um, even though you're probably going to be thrilled to have the normal schedule return. Um, you kind of want to avoid that contrast effect a little bit. And Karen, did you have other things you want to say? Yeah, no, that 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 sounded really good. And then, uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, I wanted to say that in parallel, the adults are going to be going through the same thing. I mean, some people are going to think, hey, you know, it kind of is great to work in your pajamas. <laughs> or it's really great to not fight uh, rush hour tra traffic every day, right? Uh, so, um, you know, again, if we think in parallel about the stresses that the kids are going through and the stresses that we're are going through at the same time is that there are going to be these little things that we're noticing that are making us question, you know, things in our daily life as we've put this full stop on. It's been uh, sort of bring this time of reflection and, you know, it's sort of strange insights into, you know, what have we been doing? You know, how did we all get so busy? And did we really have to be so busy? You know, so that's going to be, you know, interesting questions. We don't know what's going to come out of all of that, right? But I think that uh, some things will go back to being the same, but others, I think, won't as a result of this very unique social, you know, experiment is to, <laughs> you know, minimizing of a term, but you know, this collective social experience that we've all been through together is, 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 it's almost like a social earthquake, right? And things will not be the same. Right, absolutely. Um, maybe we should turn it over and ask, I'm gonna unmute everybody, but please mute on your end. Um, if you're not speaking, but if anybody wanted to ask a specific question of Dr. Hurley or an issue that uh, you're concerned about, um, I'm gonna go ahead and unmute. Feel free to do that. Everyone's shy. Well, I'll what ask. Are you? Okay, good, good. Um, my daughter is 11, we are in full seeing puberty she started in January and she is I don't know really struggling she we took a break last year she finally hit her stride and she's just I don't know I guess really more aware of what it is and really more aware of I don't know it's just is there any resources for you know Cuba kids in puberty and I I don't know. I feel like she's she's not autistic, so she doesn't mm -hmm. fall into that category. Uh, it's she's just really struggling right now. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and and I hear you. And you know, you you're just at the very beginning of a destabilizing time anyway, and so this just puts a big underline on it for you. Um, so you know, I would. Uh, so first of all, um, you know, a lot of listening right now, finding out what her concerns are, being curious about her point of view. How is she seeing these things? Um, that, you know, that's a starting place. Um, I've been uh, keeping my eye out for uh, good resources. There's, you know, there's so much out there. I did find this one uh, website that I forwarded um, to uh, Kristen just before we started. It's called Hey Sigmund, as in Sigmund Freud. And there's, um, there's a, uh, and the focus of the website, it's an Australian woman, and she has these um, mindfulness videos for kids. She has this thing called uh, the hot chocolate breath, which, you know, I want to go and try, <laughs> um, right? Um, and, but but she, has, she has stuff for kids, but she also has stuff for teens. And, and her stuff is for neurotypical children. So, um, the, you know, that would be one thing to explore. Right. I have a you know? too. Um, yeah. okay. American girl, American girl used to have some books on the care and keeping of you. We we did like that. that. You did all those. Okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah and, and another thing uh, that might be good right now is um, does she have uh, 
uh, stories that she already likes, especially, you know, books or, or movies that show kids in adversity, right? Harry Potter is a classic one. I mean, he, he had to deal with a lot of issues. You know, the, the rise of uh, he who shall not be named was, you know, something that just overtook, you know, the whole wizarding society, right? So the adults were struggling, the kids were struggling, and, and there was really, uh, you saw what did it take to be resilient? It meant that you didn't have everything together all the time, meant that you, you know, but, you know, you kind of dug down and found ways to cope. You really, you know, so, you know, any, uh, and there's so many different stories that have that as a theme. Fairy tales, right? You know, Cinderella had resilience and she had, you know, helpers. So, you know, uh, asking, you know, talking to her about her favorite stories, you can start to bring out that theme of, oh yeah, you know, this person, she went through something really hard. Um, there's also that, um, there's that book called uh, Fever. Uh, I, I'm trying to remember the author. And it talks about the uh, yellow fever epidemic in Philadelphia. And there was a, a teen girl who w had to cope with um, like the, uh, you know, the illness in the, in the whole city. And, you know, that might be something that you could read together and talk about and, and uh, elicit some of her ideas so that it's not just something happening to, to, to her. You're starting to think about, oh, this is what it is like to be in the world. Right? This is the task that you're preparing her for her anyway. This is not the entry you wanted to give her. But, you know, this is, what, this is the world we have. I so apologize thank you. for everybody. Yeah, but, well. um, thank you for inviting me, Christine. Good luck, everyone. We're we're in it together. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Fraser. Thank you so much. Uh huh. We'll continue. We'll continue for just a couple minutes. Sure. I wanted to kind of redirect a little bit because we have several um, adults who are also um, on the call and who, who maybe like myself, have been struggling a little bit, you know, coping mechanisms about if we're concerned about the immunity, but yet we have to go to the grocery store and buy groceries for our children, mm -hmm. how do we handle that? Or if we're a parent of a child and we don't want to bring these germs home to our children, maybe you have some pointers in dealing with your patients and, um, mm -hmm. and how we can, you know, handle that. That's right, yeah. And, and I think it's, uh, it's hard to feel empowered as a, pre uh, as a parent right now, or uh, uh, hard to feel empowered even about protecting your own health when there is, you know, somewhat of conflicting advice. Uh, you know, people are using different kinds of precautions, different levels of precautions. You see people in community who are not taking precautions, and that can make you angry. Because, uh, you know, if you see someone, you're walking around the grocery store and someone just is, you know, being defiant about social distancing and they just, they stand next to you in line, right? And then right. so you have to say something to them, right? So, so, so this is definitely challenging. So I think, um, you know, you want to be a good consumer of health information. You know, so, you know, uh, getting using trusted resources to get best practices for, uh, you know, uh, you know, wearing uh, wearing gloves at this point is a good idea. If you're going someplace that has high touch surfaces, right? Uh, washing your hands very frequently. We've heard that over and over again. Um, but also there's a certain point where you do your very best and uh, if you've done your, you know, and, and so, uh, you know, there's that little bit of doubt left, right? And that's where guilt can creep in, right? It kind of sneaks in underneath. And I think that that's what people struggle with is that real sense of, uh, you know, did I, did I do enough to protect my child? So the way that I say that sometimes is that helplessness and guilt are close cousins. Right? When you see one, you often see the other, right? 
So being able to accept your, uh, you know, that, you know, we're all doing the best we can, but even best practices don't protect everybody. So, you know, uh, limiting your trips as much as you can, using delivery, you know, doing things of that nature, but also understanding that we are in something that is bigger than us, right? And that that um, makes us feel vulnerable, right? And then, you know, if, you t if that vulnerability then turns around into guilt and that starts eating at you, then that's going to start constricting you as a parent. You're going to be more worried. You're going to be more, you know, uh, it's going to be harder to keep that, that nice, open, positive uh, space that Tom was talking about. Absolutely. Is there anyone else that has a specific question or something um, that you or a family member is struggling with that you wanted to um, ask of Dr. Hurley? Anyone? I, I noticed here, I see some discussion about, you know, what resources do we trust? Because there's a lot of different, there's a lot of different resources out there. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to compile a, a list and uh -huh. share that with you and try to share that often um, consulting advisory board members and um, our advisors that handle and work with our patients quite frequently mm -hmm. but yeah it is it is quite overwhelming like dr hurley said I, I would agree with her and we're using these practices in our own household you know now is a good time to use gloves when you go out for two reasons you know, you won't touch your face typically if you have these gloves on. And then if you peel them off from the top appropriately and throw them away, you're not taking as many germs, you know, mm -hmm. different things like that. Um, mm -hmm. We're going to try to put together in one central location so that we can share that with, with you all. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's really great because um, a lot of the hospitals will have, uh, you know, well vetted resources. The CDC obviously is another one. Um, I think, you know, I, I also wanted to offer, um, there's a couple of kind of emotional first aid, uh, techniques that I sometimes, uh, teach to patients, uh, you know, just for, they're not uh, a miracle cure, but sometimes it's not making the anxiety go away, but it's more getting it back down to a manageable level. If it feels a little more manageable, a little more livable, you're going to be more comfortable and you'll be more effective in coping with stress. So um, the first one I call the grounding exercise, and you may have heard this one. And what you do is either you do this yourself or you guide someone else in doing it, is you look around the room, the physical room you're in, and name three things that are blue. And you say them out loud. Okay, I see a blue lamp, a blue book cover, there's a blue stripe on the rug. And then you do it again and you say, what are three more things that are not red? And you go ahead and name those. I see a green plant. I see a white sweater, right? So what this does is that it shifts you out of anxiety brain back into logical brain because you're, you're naming things. And it can just bring you back a little, it's a little, it helps you feel a little more centered. So, and you can use any color you want, right? You can switch them up, but uh, you know, three things that are this color, three more things that are not that color, right? And that, then that can help. Another one is when thoughts are really spiraling out of control, like this is never gonna end. Whatever you say something like that, is you stick a, phrase, you stick a couple words in the beginning. I feel like this is never going to end. Then you notice the difference between saying, oh, this is never going to end, and I feel like this is never going to end. It gives you a very gentle lift up off of the thought, just a little gentle lift, and then it allows you to take a second look at that fear that you're having. It's very natural to have this feeling. You can accept that you're afraid, right? But when you state it as a fact, it's harder to combat. When it's a feeling, then you can start to address the feeling. 
So sh sticking the words, I feel like, in front of any sentence can help you get that little bit of a lift and a little bit of a relief. Um, and the last one I'll suggest is, uh, you know, and this is more for the adults, is you know how when you're driving and you're going into a skid um, and your natural impulse is to try to turn the car back, but that actually makes the skid worse? The same happens with anxiety, right? So you can think of 